uh, and we welcome you to the East Salon ABC at the Library of Congress's National Book Festival. I'm Mark Sweeney, the Principal Deputy Librarian at the Library of Congress. And if you're interested in nonfiction writers, whether they're tackling some of the most pressing issues facing our country, or historians who help readers feel as, as if they're vividly in the past, you're in the right place today. We're thrilled that C-SPAN's Book TV viewers are also joining us. We're thankful for the strong partnership between the Library of Congress and C-SPAN. And I also want to thank the members of our James Madison Council, the philanthropic group that supports the engaging projects such as this 24th National Book Festival. We hope you'll visit the library up on Capitol Hill to research about subjects you're interested in or see the beautiful Jefferson Building or attend one of our Live at the Library events when we keep the library open till 8 p.m. on Thursday nights and present dynamic free events. And you can be part of helping us produce these free events and others like today's festival, Family Day, by joining the Friends of the Library. Just this week, the Friends helped bring an exceptional group of 19 librarians from around the world to the Library of Congress to share their stories and best practices serving the blind and print disabled. Your support extends the reach of the library and allows all people everywhere to benefit. Consider becoming a friend. Find out more at loc.gov donate. Our first event in this stage in this room is titled To the Edge of the World, Rethinking and Exploration. Amanda Bellows is a professor of American history at the New School whose writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Her new book is titled The Explorers, A History of America in Ten Expeditions. She'll be talking with Hampton Sides, the author of the best-selling narrative histories Blood and Thunder, and Hellbound on His Trail, among others. But he's at the festival this year to talk about his newest book, The Wide, Wide Sea, Imperial Ambition, First Contact, and the Fateful Final Voyage of Captain James Cook. Leading the conversation is Frederick Weary. He is a professor of sociology at Princeton University where he is also the Vice Dean of Diversity and Inclusion in the Office of the Dean of Faculty. Have a wonderful day at the festival, and let's welcome them on our stage. Thank you. Uh, so let me just start out by saying that it was a real gift uh, to be asked to read these books and to moderate this discussion. And it's in part a gift because of the kinds of questions that it stirs up. Um, and, and when I, I see a book about explorers, I always wonder, why that guy? Um, <laughs> of all the people uh, that you could have chosen, why did you, Hampton, decide to go with Captain James Cook? And why did you, Amanda, decide to go with not one, but 10 explorers, including Sacagawea, and Matthew Henson, the son of a sharecropper who went to the North Pole, so why? Uh, well, in my case, uh, I had done a number of books that took me to some uh, extreme parts of the world that uh, my wife did not want to go to with me, um, like Siberia and uh, rem remote parts of the Philippines and Korea, right up uh, against the border with North Korea. And uh, she actually, I, I only say this half facetiously, but she did say, why don't you pick a book that involves travel to some places that, you know, that I'd like to go to? Um, and I said, well, let me think about that. And three days later, I, I said, well, how about Captain Cook? And she's like, well, where did he go? And Tonga, uh, Tahiti, uh, Hawaii, of course, New Zealand, Australia, Tasmania, uh, pretty much everywhere in the Pacific um, he went. And that's sort of the facetious answer to your question. I, Captain Cook has been on my radar for a long time. Um, he was one of the great explorers of all time, um, but I couldn't figure out a way into that story as an American writer with an American publisher and a largely American readership 
uh, it's, it's sort of been the province of the Brits and the Australians and the, and the, and the Kiwis. Uh, but then I realized that Captain Cook's third voyage, which is the subject of the book, uh, was a very American tale. Um, they, they left in July of 1776, uh, just as the uh, certain events were heating up in, uh, in Boston and Philadelphia. Um, and uh, they go around the world to explore the west coast of the North American continent. Along the way, they stumble upon this amazing archipelago, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and they chart the coast of Oregon and Washington and, and nearly the entire coast of, of Alaska. And so I started to realize this is an American story. And much more interesting to pick one of his three voyages, because he had three enormous around-the-world voyages. And it would have been a book about you know, 3,000 pages if I had decided to do all three of them. Um, and that's how I gravitated to Captain Cook, who I'll talk a little later about just his personality, his accomplishments, uh, an extraordinary, complicated, and now quite controversial uh, explorer. Um, so what about you, Amanda? Yes. <laughs> well, I think in American history, um, certain explorers have gotten an outsized amount of attention. So we all know names like Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Kit Carson, kind of these men on the Western frontier. And I wondered whose stories had been left out um, of the narrative of the history of US exploration. So I came up with um, 10 amazing explorers um, from diverse backgrounds, each of whom made different kinds of discoveries, both in the continental US and outside of it. And each chapter of the book um, covers the journey of that explorer. And, and as I'm reading this, this book, I'm, I start to wonder just who these people were. So they're deeply human in the way that they're portrayed in the book. And I'm imagining that they had some personality traits <laughs> that readers might find surprising. Sure, yeah, in my case, um, one of the things that drew me to Captain Cook is that uh, unlike most captains in the British Navy of that time, he came from nothing, a uh, very modest background from the moors of, of Yorkshire. Uh, he worked his way up from, from poverty uh, by sheer sort of ferocious work ethic and uh, a genius for astronomy and map making. And uh, so many of the captains of that day had connections, they had money, they, they had some, some foothold that got them where they were. In his case, it was merit. It was merit. And uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is that he was raised by Quakers. And uh, he wasn't himself really Quaker, but he imbibed a lot of their kind of values, frugality and uh, you know, temperance. And uh, like he, would, he had a ferocious temper on, on board these ships. Ferocious, but he never cursed. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike everyone else in the Navy. Um, and, uh, but what I like most about him and what I think is interesting is that although he was self-educated, he had no certainly no uh, training as an anthropologist, he becomes on these three voyages around the world something of a proto-anthropologist. Uh, he is there to describe and document uh, ceremonies and implements of war and you know, how these societies, mostly Polynesian societies, uh, functioned. And you get this kind of agnostic, um, uh, you know, fair-minded, uh, analysis of these people. Uh, he never once tries to convert them to Christianity or, or, or show them just, you know, just how, you know, what their, the shortcomings of their society versus the British society. And this is very, very rare among captains, European captains of that day. He, um, he's documenting all this stuff, and then all this stuff gets published in these enormous folio-sized uh, volumes. Uh, spreading all this knowledge around the world about how these societies function, also new, new animal species, new plant species that had never been described by, at least by Europeans before. And um, you get this kind of, uh, it's, you really view him as a product of the Enlightenment. And uh, I like that about him. Uh, we can get to a lot of his negative qualities maybe a little bit later, because there are plenty of them. <laughs> yes, and so for the explorers in my book, um, it was interesting to see what traits they might have shared and which traits um, 
were specific to each explorer, but some of the things they had in common that might not surprise you would be curiosity, um, a passion to discover whatever it was they were interested in. So that differed, though, for people. You know, for Matthew Henson, it was a drive to be the first person to reach the North Pole. Um, for, um, let's see, for John Muir, right, he is in the Yosemite Valley, and his passion was to preserve the landscape. Um, for Amelia Earhart, her drive was to circumnavigate the globe. Um, for Sally Ride, her drive was to go into that frontier of space. So I think that passion is common across all the explorers. Um, but some surprising traits might be um, flexibility or adaptability. So on the one hand, you have to be single-minded and focusing on your goal. And on the other hand, you have to really be able to change when uh, things might go wrong during your expedition. Uh, so to change course when necessary. And then finally, I think sometimes we think of explorers as kind of rugged individuals. But really, for so many explorers, or cook too, probably. Um, you need to be a good leader, but you also need to work well as a team because there's often a team of people supporting your expedition, be it again that journey to the North Pole, um, an airplane trip across an ocean, a space shuttle journey around the globe. So lots of people help make um, exploration successful. Yeah, and you just uh, mentioned how things go wrong. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things that we see in the book is in both of the books. They've got maps, and in moments in which you really need the maps to be correct, mm -hmm. the maps are wrong. Mm -hmm. Just wrong and, and dangerously wrong. They've got instruments for navigation, and they're needing to also improve upon those instruments and make new instruments, but sometimes those instruments aren't even reliable. So how do you, how did they navigate these spaces of uncertainty when the knowledge that they were passed uh, that was passed down to them about what's there and what's not there just, just wasn't correct. Yeah, I think we, we, we have to peel back the layers of what we not know the, the planet looks like now. Uh, and we, we have GPS and we have satellite maps and all kinds of great tools. And go back to those times and, and try to imagine what those explorers were dealing with. Captain Cook um, especially was aggravated and frustrated with the, the maps he had to work with because uh, he was a map maker. That was his main skill. Over, over and above all his other skills as a captain or, or as an anthropologist or anything else, he was a map maker. And he would look at these cartoonishly wrong maps uh, that were provided by the Admiralty, uh, perhaps emanating from uh, Bering's expedition, say, 20 years earlier. And he, and he would try to reconcile what he's seeing with these maps, and then he would just, you know, he basically learned the hard way that a bad map is worse than no map at all. I think something we all kind of know. And then he would just chuck that map and start charting, start measuring, start observing, and we get our very first uh, chart of the entire Alaskan coastline, and it, it's pretty accurate. It's, it's, um, it's pretty cool, actually, that he was able to do that in one summer. Um, there's a famous map that he did uh, earlier in his career when he was um, in, in the Navy during, during the French, uh, just after the French and Indian War, where he mapped the entire um, coastline of Newfoundland. And uh, there's a documentary, a British documentary, where they superimpose his map on top of a satellite map of Newfoundland. And it is chillingly accurate. Uh, how he did this with just trigonometry and you know, dead reckoning and uh, just, a, just observation uh, with the crude tools that he had to work with in his day is, is, kind, of, is kind of extraordinary. And in, so in response to your question, I think I'll focus on the Corps of Discovery's journey across the continental United States. So, you know, Lewis and Clark are tasked by the U.S. government with trying to figure out if a Northwest Passage exists, some kind of water route across the ocean. And when they reached uh, present-day North Dakota, that's when they ran into um, Sacagawea, who had been captured from Idaho and was living in the Knife River villages then. So she and her husband, Toussaint Charbonneau, joined the Corps of Discovery, and they're all going together um, across the continent. And so the maps that they had for the western portion of the United States um, were very poor. They didn't know the extent of the mountain range. They didn't know how far the rivers went. But um, 
Sacagawea was able to point out different landmarks that she knew having grown up in Idaho and spent time in the West. So as they got closer into that region, she was able to do that. And then another thing that people did um, was they asked for directions. <laughs> so, so really, if you look at the diaries of Lewis and Clark, you'll see that they're constantly speaking with people from different um, indigenous groups. And they're asking, what do you know about this region? What trails already exist? You know, what do you recommend is the best way to go? And so they're often, you know, in this expedition and others, people are often drawing on um, indigenous knowledge as well. I don't know if that was true for Cook. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, um, yeah, Cook was constantly asking for directions from Polynesian wayfarers. And something that's really interesting about uh, Cook's voyage is, is that he began to understand, he was the first European explorer to begin to understand the extent of the Polynesian diaspora. You know, just like these amazing wayfarers who populated uh, the entire Pacific Ocean from Easter Island to, you know, New Zealand to Hawaii to the Society Islands and beyond. Um, they did this with some kind of superior knowledge of, of, how, of the stars and the, the migration patterns of marine mammals and birds, and understanding the currents. And, and uh, so Cook is constantly asking them, you know, questions and kind of tapping into their knowledge and also simultaneously just wondering how did they do this? How did these were planned migrations? These weren't just accidental driftings. Um, and so I think. Um, that's another credit to his personality. So many European uh, captains, they don't care what the native people think, but he's constantly um, realizing they have this phenomenal, you know, so font of knowledge uh, that he wants to tap into, um, and, uh, and he does. And, and Cook and other explorers are not just tapping into this knowledge, they're also, um, they seem to be, uh, opening up a gateway for some of these indigenous peoples to become explorers with them. And so I, I, I'm thinking, Hampton, about Mai and, oh, okay. and Amanda. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded again of Sacagawea. Um, so can you tell us how their lives might inform the way that we think about the legacies of explorers like James Cook and Lewis and Clark? Um, that's a great question. Yes, just returning to Sacagawea. So as I mentioned, you know, she was 12 years old when she was um, kidnapped by members of the Hidatsa tribe and brought to those Knife River villages. So think about, you know, four years later, she's 16, she has a newborn baby, and she's off on this journey. For Lewis and Clark and the other members of the Corps of Discovery, it is a, a journey of discovery because they've never been to this region. Um, but for Sacagawea, it's like a return to her homeland. Um, she does many important things as part of the Corps of Discovery. I mentioned that she's identifying landmarks on the way. She's also, you know, finding root vegetables and things to sustain the Corps of Discovery. She saves their supplies when one of their boats capsizes in the river. And she negotiates um, with the Shoshone people once they make it out um, further west for horses, the horses that enable them to get, you know, over those mountains since there is no Northwest Passage. Um, so what I tried to do in my book was to really show what a critical role she played in the Corps of Discovery. And I think indigenous people in general, again, in this expedition and other expeditions, are really playing an important role in um, sharing knowledge. Uh, so yeah, in my book, you mentioned the character Mai. Um, th there's a young Polynesian man named Mai who was the first um, Polynesian to set foot on English soil who came to England as part of Cook's second voyage around the world. And he becomes a, ma a major character in the book and a, and a major celebrity in England during that time. For two years, he, he's, they, they roll out the red carpet for him, and they, they love him. He is um, you know, uh, dressed up in all sorts of finery, and they give him a, they, he gets a, a, a vaccination for smallpox. He learns to hunt at the estates of the aristocracy. He becomes a, you know, a bit of a card sharp, and uh, you know, he learns backgammon and chess, and uh, goes to all the salons in in, Lon in London. He meets with uh, Boswell and Johnson, and goes to the Royal Society, and you know, he's paraded around England somewhat patronizingly as kind of the noble savage. Uh, but they. Um, but they love him, 
and the, the ladies seemed to have, take a fondness to him as well. <laughs> but after two years, uh, Mai, who is, is, has been paraded around England, is becoming to understand a little something about English society, and by this point he's really learned English, um, he's homesick. He wants to go home. He wants to go back to Tahiti. Uh, and King George III of England says, well, we'll take you home, and King, the person who's going to do it is Captain Cook. Uh, so Captain Cook becomes his sort of personal chauffeur and uh, delivery man, uh, brings Mai back to Polynesia, but now he's got all these belongings. He's got all these gifts that he's been given, including horses and sheep and, and, and goats and a, a full suit of armor <laughs> and guns and muskets, you know, uh, ammunition, swords, all this stuff, and uh, the Tahitians don't know what to, uh, to make of him. He actually comes from a fairly uh, uh, poor background uh, in a very highly stratified society. Uh, they don't know now what to make of this commoner, as they would call him, who is now suddenly rich and has been around the world. Um, so it becomes a sort of a story of, I don't know, he becomes kind of a man without a country. He's not English. He's not really Tahitian anymore. He's, he, so he's something else. And uh, I follow him through this experience. Uh, but along the way, Cook uses him uh, very much like Sacagawea, I, I guess you would say, in the sense that he becomes a translator, he becomes a guide, he becomes an envoy in negotiations as they move from Polynesian island to Polynesian island on their way to Tahiti. So he becomes an important part of the, the, the whole voyage and uh, brings you through this experience. Your, your um, story reminds me a little bit of Thomas Wolfe and the idea of, you know, you could never go home again. And mm -hmm. I think for Sacagawea and for Mai, you know, those returns back home, they had been changed by their journeys. And so yeah. it was a different experience. Yeah, I, I think very much so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think one of the things that certainly would would have changed me is um, there are moments in, in the books where you can see a great deal of honor and discipline and restraint um, from the explorers. And that's something that gives you, a, a, you know, for me, a lot of pride. I'm like, these are people who were really sort of bent on discovery, but really sort of they held, they held the line, mm -hmm. um, sometimes under difficult circumstances. And then there are moments in which you would see the model behavior somehow break. It would snap in a moment, and we would see some eruptions of just violence that looked um, senseless. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you, as authors, make sense of what looks to be, from time to time, senseless acts of violence? Yeah, well, so now we get into some of the negative uh, qualities of Cook. Uh, on his first and second voyage, he was pretty famous for being um, quite lenient with his men, quite tolerant, quite um, you know, reluctant to use the lash, um, quite sympathetic with the native people he was encountering. Um, on his third voyage, the final voyage, the subject of my book, um, we get a very different Cook. And um, a lot of biographers and and historians and even sort of forensic kind of medical people have wondered what was wrong with Captain Cook on this third voyage. Um, he, he had a ferocious temper, uh, but much more so this time. He's using the lash on his own men all the time. Uh, he's perpetrating acts of violence, as you t mentioned, uh, against the native people repeatedly. Um, he's just you know, his famous qualities as a kind of a diplomat um, have, have left him, and he has become this uh, kind of tyrant uh, in episodes. It, it, you know, we see the old cook every now and then, and then he snaps, as you say. He snaps repeatedly, leading up to the events surrounding his death in Hawaii, the, where it was really a series of bad judgment calls on his part. Uh, his temper got the better of him and uh, a series of sort of miscues and miscommunications uh, result ultimately in, uh, I guess this is a spoiler, uh, Captain Cook dies. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he dies a very, a very gra in a gra very graphic and very violent way. Uh, and many people think he had it coming, that it, he deserved it, that uh, 
this was karma coming back around. And when you go to that site in Hawaii on the big island where he was killed, uh, there's still a lot of, I don't know, juju in the air. It's, it's, it's a weird feeling. Um, and uh, all of this goes back to these, this thing about being a commander, being in control, having this equanim equanimity of his personality, then suddenly abandoning him and on this third voyage. Some people have said he had a parasite that prevented the um, absorption of vitamins, that he essentially had some kind of brain damage. Other people have said he had classic bipolar disorder. And it is true that he went to nearly to Antarctica, and he went deep into the Arctic as well, so he was bipolar. Um, <laughs> so, oh, boy. Um, okay. But something was wrong with the captain, and that's something, uh, a big theme in the book, to try to figure out what, what it was. And I'm sure that's true with so many of your... I mean, there's a lot of pressure and stress running an expedition and being a commander, and I'm sure with a lot of yours, you get people who are losing it at times. Yeah. Well, uh, so most of the explorers in my book do, typically hold it together, and you know, we're, which is good. Um, but I, but one thing that the book I think really brings out is the fact that you know you could have people with good intentions who have you know, objectives of discovery and that kind of thing. Um, but exploration often leads to settlement, and settlement leads to violence in so many cases. Um, the violent displacement of indigenous people in the United States and in other regions of the world discussed in the book. Um, it, uh, environmental destruction is often a consequence of the settlement that follows um, exploration, the spread of disease, to which indigenous people had little to no immunity, and that's very harmful. So that's one thing um, that really comes out in the book. And I think two of the most kind of egregious examples of that were the gold rush era in California. Um, so if you think about people's objectives, right, in getting to California, it's about the acquisition of resources um, to enrich themselves. And so, you know, there was genocide against the, the indigenous people of California, just a level of um, terrible violence and that's really a tragedy in American history. And the other example that comes to mind from the book would be in the Belgian Congo in the era of imperialism. So you have King Leopold II you know, treating the Congo like his own um, colony, and he wants to get harvest as much rubber as he can because it's the industrial, um, you know, the nation, nations around the world are industrializing and they need rubber for different things. And so um, agents of the state of Belgium are you know, committing these atrocities against the Congolese people. So that's to say, right, that um, exploration and discovery leads to things that perpetuate violence, particularly against indigenous people, and that's a very sad pattern we've seen across world history. Mm -hmm. um, which is why some people will simply say, if you've got these adventures that are causing so much harm, and, and they have a history of causing harm, should we be doing them anymore? Mm -hmm. Should we have done them then? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so what do you say to that? Why explore? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, you know, exploration is, is inevitable. It, it, it is very much what humans do and have always done, that curiosity to know what's over the next hill or the next horizon. Uh, the, the almost obsessive need to know what the planet looks like. Um, and yes, to, to find something new, new, new animals, new societies, um, new kinds of people, new ways of organizing the world, new substances. Um, you know, it's just so deeply ingrained in our DNA that I don't think there's, you know, we're not, it's not gonna stop. <laughs> and it's, and it, 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 so it's, it, perhaps it's pointless to say, they shouldn't have gone, you know, uh, or they shouldn't have uh, wandered, you know, or wandered around the planet. Um, that said, I mean, someone like Captain Cook, you know, it, I, I mentioned that he was kind of a proto-anthropologist and, and, and unusually kind of agnostic for his time period. But he, of course, understood that he was working in the service of empire and this large, colonial and imperial chess game that was being play, played around the planet to carve up the, the, 
the remaining lands and claim them and to extract resources and all of that stuff. And the reason Captain Cook is so controversial today, it's not really what, so much what he did as an explorer and a map maker, it's that his voyages put these places on the map, uh, sometimes literally on the map, in, in very accurate maps that were published around the world. And then suddenly this accelerated the process of everything else that came. Um, the diseases, the alcohol, the, the you know, uh, occupation, um, ger you know, all sorts of uh, germs uh, uh, supplanted their econo economic system with a new form of economy. Uh, missionaries, um, you name it. Uh, the, I think it's, you know, it's been called the fatal impact. And Cook's voyages certainly accelerated that process. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a mixed bag. We, we seem to be a, hum, a, a species that can't help ourselves. We have a lot of curiosity. And it, it leads to harm, not only to the people that are visited, but also sometimes to the visitors. Uh, Cook's own men, I think, were uh, in some cases ruined by these voyages. Uh, so it's, um, it's something we need to be careful about, I guess you'd say, as we make our voyages around the world and be mindful of their impacts. I would agree with you, Hampton, mm -hmm. that you know, curiosity is innate to the human condition. And I think you know, my book shows different explorers from a wide range of backgrounds, um, men, women, um, African Americans, immigrants, indigenous people, all who share across 200 years, right, different urges to go and um, uncover new things about the world. So at its best, exploration leads to discovery, which adds to human knowledge, and I think that's a positive thing. But I think there's also so much that we can learn from history as we think about new frontiers today. And there are many new frontiers today that are really exciting, right? NASA is, has its Artemis missions, sending people back to the moon. People are trying to get to Mars. And there's so much to discover here on Earth. Um, we've got underwater exploration. We know just a, a tiny little bit about our own sea floor and all the creatures that live there. Um, so there are so many people around the world, even today, doing amazing kinds of exploratory work in the name of conservation, um, for science, uh, so I think that if we look at the past and we learn the lessons from the past about what people have not done well and we can try and apply those lessons to the present. And when we're thinking about the lessons for the present, I'm just going to stretch this a little bit more. Um, some people have taken as a lesson uh, the need to sort of say take down a statue or sort of remove uh, someone from uh, our more celebratory public discourse. And what you both seem to be doing is sort of offering up a fuller story of um, what those explorers did. And so, you know, if you were sitting with someone who um, really disagrees with you that uh, we should be celebrating uh, these various explorers, um, what might you say to if not to convince them otherwise, uh, but at least to demonstrate to them that um, maybe they've got a point, but we should do it anyway. Like, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you bring them uh, along with you? Well, in, in my case, I would, I would say that you could argue that up until the time of Cook, um, perhaps the greatest long distance voyagers, uh, arguably, um, were the Polynesians themselves. And I like to think about, well, you know, you know, as they made their migrations across the Pacific and in, you can say, colonized uh, these islands, uh, populated these islands, inhabited them, uh, mo kept moving, moving, moving. Uh, I like to think of this sort of hypothetical scenario of like, well, what if they had just kept on going? And what if they had arrived in Plymouth, England first? well before, you know, during the Stone Age of England when, uh, you know, uh, they were building Stonehenge or something. Uh, I, I like to think of that scenario and imagine how history might have been changed if the Polynesians had discovered England. Uh, it would have been interesting. Maybe you'd go through a wormhole and kind of <laughs> have this alter alternative reality, but um, 
I think, um, again, exploration, it's not just some, something that the, the Europeans did. Uh, the Chinese were extraordinary explorers. Uh, the Polynesians, obviously. Um, and, and so many other societies and cultures through time. So um, I would try to expand our understanding of what exploration is to get well beyond just the European paradigm of, of discovery. Yeah, I, I, I agree that expanding our understanding of what exploration is and who's done it is very important. I also think that history is complex. It's not always black and white. Um, and I think having a sense of nuance is important when studying history. Um, and in my book, The Explorers, you know, I try to give readers just a full picture of each person and his or her life and the context in which that person lived so that readers can, I think, decide for themselves what they think of this person, what they think of their motives or objectives, um, rather than telling people what to think. I think you know, being honest with evidence and then letting people make their own decisions is important in history as well. And my final question before we open it up to the audience. As you are writing and making decisions about what goes in the book, what you almost got in there and decided to take out, and those, also those moments of anxiety and, and doubt um, as, as a writer, what, what did you learn about yourself as you were learning about these explorers? Well, uh, that's a really good question, and a little bit of a, an imponderable. I, I, you know, I, I do think when one reason why people love exploration books um, is because is that they begin to think, would I have been able to survive that voyage? What, how would I've, I have experienced uh, ship ship conditions of those? Days, you know, with the cockroaches and the rats and the uh, weevily slops of food that they're eating, and uh, you know, we, we, it's it's a way for us to have a vicarious uh, experience, but also to question our own um, resolve and our own uh, stamina and so forth. I mean, I, and I, I just tend to think, God, I wouldn't have lasted a minute in in, <laughs> in, in these two ships of Captain Cook's, these these hundred and eighty men that went on this voyage, um, the. Um, you know, these stories are full of, you know, mutiny and uh, 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 scurvy and cannibalism and all sorts of other really delightful subjects. And, um, and, and but for some reason, I think uh, we are all uh, drawn to them um, uh, for all kinds of reasons. Yes, they may have been important voyages or expeditions, but we also are drawn to them because we like to put ourselves on the ground or in the ship uh, and try to imagine what sorts of qualities, what sorts of strengths would we be able to summon within ourselves to get through this experience. Uh, because, yeah, these voyages were not easy for, for any of these guys, uh, any of these characters in your book. Um, and I, I think that's what I think about with myself. It's like, and I think the answer is I wouldn't have survived. I, I, I'm a wimp. <laughs> I live, I, I'm, I'm too uh, I, a creature. I love my creature comforts and so forth. And I, I'm, ama I'm amazed that these men, so many of them, in Cook's case, signed up for one, then two, and then all three voyages. Uh, they were gluttons for punishment. They were sadomasochists. I don't know what it was. Uh, but it's, it's a very interesting thing to contemplate. Yes, I think writing this book and immersing myself in the stories of these people um, really gave me an appreciation for their resilience. And my favorite chapter to highlight one of the explorers is the chapter about Matthew Henson and the race to the North Pole. So Matthew Henson was the son of sharecroppers born in Maryland, not so far from here. And he was orphaned at the age of about seven. He became a cab ran away from home, became a cabin boy, sailed the world. And he ended up going on seven um, journeys to the north, toward the North Pole. Um, and the last one, he reaches the North Pole with Robert Peary. And Henson is doing this all in the Jim Crow era. So he's overcoming poverty. He's overcoming discrimination. You know, throughout his life, people said to him, you know, you're not the kind of person that can make it to the North Pole um, because you're black, you can't withstand the cold, things like that. And, you know, he was just determined to prove them wrong. 
And then when he came back, having most likely been ahead of Peary in terms of reaching the geographic North Pole first, or at least as close as the instruments of the day could have gotten him. So he comes back home, and all the newspapers give all the credit to Peary. So even after he's made this amazing accomplishment, you know, being fluent in the Inuit language, learning how to build um, sleds and how to be an expert dog sledder, right? He then faces this Jim Crow era discrimination in the aftermath. So what's compelling about his story and others is not only the physical journey that these explorers make, but also kind of um, the boundary pushing they do in terms of frontiers pushing against racism, um, sexism in many cases, lots of discrimination. And so I think that's something I admire and came away with um, from writing the book. And now we're going to open it up uh, for the audience. And there, there, there are two microphones here, uh, left and right. I will call on you for, to ask your questions. But before we start the questions, because I am a celebratory type, um, we're going to celebrate our authors right now. So thank you for that conversation. So we'll hear first and then over here. Um, hi, thank you so much for this talk. This is really interesting. I'm really looking forward to going home and reading your book, Amanda. Oh, sorry. Um, I just have a question. I'm curious, um, these expeditions, um, how did they contribute to American myth making? What were some of the narratives that emerged um, in the aftermath of these explorations? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. So how did these um, expeditions contribute to myth making? I would say that um, there are a lot of myths today about expeditions in US history. And these stories actually challenge those myths. So um, the book starts kind of with a discussion of a well-known figure, Daniel Boone, um, who you know, made inroads into Kentucky territory, crossed the Cumberland Gap, that kind of thing. And someone like Boone has an outsized presence in our popular imagination. Um, even in his own time, right, he had an autobiography. It was widely published in the United States and then Europe. Um, his, you know, in the, after his death, right, his face was used to mass market um, products in the 19th century. And in the 20th century, we've got television shows. It's the Cold War era. He's the rugged frontiersman. So actually, I would say that um, we have a lot of myths about kind of these individualistic frontiersmen that exist. And then what this book does is it brings in people that you may not know, like James Beckworth, a mountain man who was born into slavery and found freedom on the frontier, or Florence Bailey, um, a Gilded Age ornithologist whose mission for exploration was to save birds um, during this ecological crisis when birds are being slaughtered. So hopefully these books, um, these stories counter some of the existing myths. Thank you. And the gentleman over here. I have a, uh, a suggestion and followed up by a question. The suggestion is um, I wish somebody would write a book called Unintended Consequences. <laughs> um, uh, Cook and Perry. Uh, there's an argument. Cook did not get to the pole. He may have climbed uh, McKinley, but uh, he didn't get there. You said two things. One, did Perry get to the coal, coal pole, or did he get close to it? At any rate, whatever happened, people believed he did. So Amundsen, who was ready to go to the pole, turned around and went south, and. Um, went to the South Pole and beat Scott. So I wish somebody would write a book tying those four guys together. And um, uh, people have written about, well, not so much about Cook, but about the other three. But it, it hasn't been tied together. My question is, um, one, you said uh, Perry got to the pole, and then you said Henson got close to it. So um, I think that. There are still arguments about that. Uh, I like your view on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the question is, who got to the North Pole? Who got to the North Pole first? And you know, 
in 1908 and 1909, um, Frederick Cook, I was thinking Captain Cook, mm -hmm. no. Um, Frederick Cook um, claimed to have beaten Robert Peary and Matthew Henson to the North Pole. Um, I think that has been largely disproved. I think there has been some debate about how close Matthew Henson and Robert Peary and the four Inuit men who were with them um, got to the North Pole. And um, from what I've read, it seems like they got as close as you could within a few miles using the instruments of the day. So um, I think that's a pretty impressive feat. Here. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. And I couldn't help but wonder uh, some of the parallels between Cook and Columbus. Christopher Columbus, and <laughs> I, I realized, um, you know, that they were both map makers, and the impact that they had with their expeditions, and and how they put so-called places on the map. Um, but I also am feeling, and it's a feeling, how Columbus, in a way, um, in modern time, presently anyway, seems to be getting an unbalanced um, interpretation of what he did and how he put the New World on the map and, and um, you know, had similar, um, similar, um, what should I say, uh, goals of conquest which involve plundering and all of that. So my question is, and I don't know exactly how to phrase it, how do you redeem or how do you balance the view of someone like Columbus in the present time? I'm certainly not a scholar of Christopher Columbus, I'm not but a scholar either. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, and I do think it's probably, uh, uh, although Cook has in, sometimes been called um, the Columbus of the Pacific, um, I think that's an unfair characterization because Cook, Cook never left a single person behind. Uh, he did not colonize these places. He did not um, uh, participate like, like. Columbus did in, in, in you know, destruction of populations or uh, you know mass murder. Uh, he moved from island to island to island. Um, he had a few encounters that were violent, a few, um, but uh, it worked both ways. Uh, in one case, ten of his men were were killed uh, in in New Zealand, um, for example. So I think it's unfair to kind of compare those two explorers. Uh, Columbus really really was uh, um, a much darker figure in the history of the world um, than, than Cook. And now what came immediately after Cook, I get it. I mean, uh, like the, the colonization of, of Australia and Tasmania, for example, uh, that's a dark story, but that's not something that Cook himself did. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, that is a much larger, uh, darker, and uh, more complicated subject, the, the story of colonization uh, and the genocide um, that I, I think that is tied up with the legacy of, of Columbus. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, my question is for Amanda Bellows. So I appreciated how you expanded the definition of explorers in the book beyond physical exploration. Um, one of the points that you mention and then proceed to illustrate is the degree, the relatively higher degree of personal autonomy that these explorers experienced, um, especially in the 19th century um, during their explorations. For example, one of the, the examples you give is the, the 19th century West. Um, and to varying degrees, many of those same limitations and their knock-on effects um, that were placed on those explorers because of their gender, tribal statuses, citizenship, skin color, are still imposed today. So I'm curious what you would say are some of the areas where um, 
those experiencing those limitations today can be explorers in their own right and can find a greater degree of autonomy and independence? That's a great question. Um, so just thinking historically for a moment, you know, a figure like Jim Beckworth, he's born into slavery in Virginia at the turn of the 19th century. And um, he is moved, so his, his mother was most likely enslaved, his father was white, so he was biracial, and his father um, moves the family to St. Louis. There, Beckworth was emancipated by his father, and then he was able to go off and do what he wanted to do, which was to explore the Rocky Mountains. And what's interesting for Beckworth, you know, in this era, right, where slavery is legal in many parts of the United States, is that he's able to move um, through different societies. So he actually um, embeds himself among the members of the Crow Nation. He has different indigenous wives. He's in the Southwest. He marries someone there. He's in Goldwish Era, California. He really, he's really all over the country. And so, you know, just to illustrate your point that um, the West provided someone like Beckworth with more economic and social mobility than he would have um, otherwise experienced, you know, say in antebellum Virginia. Um, so, no, and I, I think, as I mentioned kind of at the end, I think there are so many frontiers today still um, and places to explore in the world. Hopefully, people have good, you know, knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge being a primary objective. And um, I guess I'll make a plug for the Explorers Club in New York City, um, which has people from all over the world of every different kind of background, as you suggest. And it, you know, gives grants to people and publicizes their different kinds of research. So um, people of all backgrounds should definitely check out the Explorers Club as a place for um, reaching new frontiers. Thank you. Thanks. How do you um, approach collecting research for your books, and how do you decide what you want to include? You know, you, do you have an hour? Um, I, it's very complicated, um, especially when you have a subject like Captain Cook, where there is a voluminous amount of material on not just Cook's own journals, uh, but uh, the journals of his officers, the journals and uh, un unauthorized books that were r penned by members of the voyage. It's just a huge amount of material to get your arms around. And um, uh, I, I, I'm kind of old fashioned, first of all. I, I can't um, look at digital stuff on the screen all the time. I need to have a physical book that I can hopefully mark up. And um, I was taught when you go into libraries, you know, you can't, you know, mark up a book. And by the way, a big shout out to libraries everywhere. Uh, and, and a big shout out to the, the greatest library in the world, uh, the greatest library certainly in this country, the Library of Congress. So, um, so don't, don't mark up uh, library books, but if you, know, if you have, uh, I tend to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books that I, I mark up. They're usually cheap versions of, of books or um, sometimes photocopied versions of the books because I need to have things underlined, and that's be how I begin to absorb my material and, and get it um, uh, distilled. But everyone has their own, own way of doing it. Uh, what, what is your, what is your uh, technique? Uh, yes, well, I mean, I was thinking about you know, how expansively you want to look at things. So many of the 10 explorers that I wrote about have autobiographies. You can't just rely on someone's autobiography to tell the story. It's really important to have a well-rounded understanding of the time in which they lived. You know, what did they tell the truth about? What were they um, not telling the truth about? So I think my best piece of advice to researchers, of course, would be to use a wide range of primary and secondary sources to get a full picture of um, someone's life and circumstances. So we've got four questions left and about seven minutes. Um, and after those questions, what will happen is uh, you will be able to meet the authors down on level two uh, in Halls DE, line 11, or just look for them uh, if you want to get your book signed. Uh, and I recommend doing that. Uh, it's, it's quite an experience. So what we're probably going to do to be efficient, we're going to do two questions at a time, and that way we get the last four in. So first here and then here.
Uh, yeah, I think um, certainly in the case of Cook, and I guess some of your explorers, um, exploring was that job funded by the state, I guess. Um, but I got wondering, outside of the job, were there also, in, in their spare time, were there also explorers that they enjoy just wandering in the wilderness and things, or did they prefer to just sit at home and rest uh, uh -huh. after their, <laughs> their journeys? Oh, here. Uh, my question is like, so like in the, especially in like the 19th century era, like, you know, because you talked about like, well, when they went to like, uh, you know, like Cook went to Hawaii and like he had one motive. Were there any conflicts, especially when, especially when explorers get back home, like is there any like conflicts that like when they've had in their own, like when they go back to their own like geological societies or geographic societies and like about like the experiences that like, those people kind of have on like, you know, like the, what, like, oh, here's the, mo the motive that the commissioners of the expo uh, exploration actually have in mind and like, and then the explorer comes back and say, oh, it, that's not like, you know, like that, is there? <laughs> mm -hmm. these, I think these questions, I'm sorry. Oh, so uh, I change my mind all the time about things. <laughs> so we're gonna do two more questions uh, just to make sure that you two have enough time to fully answer in the time that we have remaining. So here and then then there. OK, Hampton, your, your book was extremely interesting. I've never read anything about Cook before. Um, two weeks ago, I was in England. I was over in Whitby. Oh, so yeah. okay. I got to see where he apprenticed with the Quaker and where his ships were built. Absolutely fascinating. Yep. Quick question. I'm a retired nurse. Tell us, share with us about his, how he took care of his sailors regarding their diet and all that. That's my question. And I'm so glad I'm not trying to keep four questions in my head right now. <laughs> First, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And then second, simple question with, regarding your art. Is there a favorite moment in your research? We talk about discovery of all these explorers, but as researchers, I'm imagining that you may have discovered something in your research that you realized either hadn't been found before or had not, that you had a chance to interpret differently. So favorite moment. Wow, this is like speed dating here. I got to got to do this fast. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, so uh, you know, historians I think have a, a fantasy that they'll find a, a descendant of their main character who has a little, you know, has a trunk in the attic that's you know full of um, yellowed old letters and personal papers, and um, that actually happened to me one time for a previous book that I wrote called In the Kingdom of Ice. And that's, that's a wonderful thing when you get that treasure trove of, of original documents that have never been seen for hundreds of years. Um, that did not happen with Captain Cook, uh, unfortunately. Captain Cook's wife inexplicably burned all the family papers shortly before she died. Um, it's a mystery why she did it, and it's a kind of a source of many conspiracy theories, actually. Um, but Captain Cook, the other thing about, uh, the, the other question was his, um, his understanding of diet and his forcing his men to eat fresh food and vegetables and uh, fresh meat uh, left, le led to the fact that his voyages were the first long distance voyages in the history of the planet, as far as we know, where not a single man died of scurvy because he was beginning to understand uh, something about scurvy uh, and um, forced this food down their throats sometimes, sort of like eat your vegetables kind of idea. Um, so those are. Two of the questions, anyway. You jump in with, uh, sure. w w yeah. with what you remember all the questions. I thought those questions worked really well together. Um, very quickly, I can say that most of my explorers in the book did not like to rest on their laurels at home. They wanted to get back out there as soon as they could. And in order to do that, they often had to raise money because not all these expeditions were government funded. A lot of them, they had to raise money from people to go where they needed to go. So there was a practical um, element to that. And then in terms of favorite moments, um, I could think of just two that come to mind. One is there's nothing like being in an archive and seeing not just documents, but actual objects that were significant in history. So um, Morgan State University has some of Matthew Henson's um, the Arctic Explorer's belongings. And so seeing his gloves um, were amazing. And then also I took a two week journey in the footsteps of the Corps of Discovery. So going from St. Louis all the way to the Oregon coast and standing there in front of the ocean and imagining how they must have felt you know, after their uh, extremely long journey. It took me a lot less time, but just looking out on the ocean and you feel that connection with explorers of the past and that felt really good. 
So before you all head out to level two, line 11, uh, to meet the authors, uh, let me just uh, thank the authors for rekindling the spirit of discovery. Thank you so much. Thank you.